The Ontario Diagnostic Days on realagriculture.com is brought to you by the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, the University of Guelph, Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association, and sponsored by the Grain Farmers of Ontario, Agris Co-op, BASF, Bear and DeKalb, Corteva and Pioneer, Great Lakes Grain, The Mosaic Company, and Syngenta. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to Ontario Diagnostic Days, Episode 2. Today we're going to focus on insects and plant disease. And to uh, kick things off, we're joined by Omafra field pathologist Albert Tenuta. Albert will take a close look at two soybean diseases, Phytophthora root rot and Fusarium wilt. He'll discuss how to identify both and manage the diseases. Next up, we have Omafra field entomologist Tracy Bowdy. Tracy will discuss the latest pest issues we're seeing in 2020 and review the many natural enemies, those beneficials that are working hard in your field to control yield robbing pests. We'll then be joined again by Albert Tenuta, who will offer tips on how to manage sudden death syndrome in your soybeans. We'll wrap up the episode with a pathologist roundtable featuring Tenuta, Michigan State's Martin Chilvers, and Darcy Talenko from Purdue University. They'll discuss tar spot, a new corn leaf disease that's spreading across the Corn Belt. It's also had a big impact in Michigan and it's heading for Ontario. Again, this episode, CEU credits are available for CCAs who have registered for Diagnostic Days. Look for the URL where you can apply for your credits. You'll see that on the screen at various points throughout the episode. And finally, we want to give you an opportunity to engage with our experts. We've included contact information for all the experts at the end of the episode. You can also put your question into our YouTube channel as you're watching the episode. We'll make sure that the experts get the question and get you some answers. Here's episode two. Hello there, I'm Albert Tenuta, field crop extension pathologist with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs based out of Ridgetown. Hey, when it comes to Phytophthora root rot and soybeans, there's no better place in Canada, hey heck, probably the world to be at than the Eugene Whalen Experimental Farm, the Agriculture Agri-Food Canada Experimental Farm in Woodsley, Ontario. And it's been a long history of Phytophthora research here since since the mid-1970s. This area of Essex County in Ontario, um, on the heavy clay soils, we've had Phytophthora down here from the 50s, 60s, and beyond. So a long history of Phytophthora root rot in the area. Unfortunately, we've also had injuries, losses, symptoms as we're seeing here in, the, in these plots as well over those years. And it comes and goes um, over time depending on what's happening in the soil, what's happening with the different pathotypes of the Phytophthora um, pathogen and, and how it's able to succumb or bypass some of the resistance and tolerance that we've been able to incorporate into very good soybean, commercial soybean varieties um, in, in Ontario. This year we had cool wet conditions that followed up with hot dry conditions and then about two Two and a half weeks ago, we started getting some pounding rains in this area. And we started getting a lot of calls, uh, myself, many of the ag retailers, about soybeans that were going backwards, starting to wilt in, in those fields. And the result was root rots. And everybody said everything's Phytophthora root rot. Phytophthora is a big one. And let's talk about Phytophthora root rot. What do you expect to see? First of all, after those heavy rains, saturated soils, heavy clay soils, those are all ideal conditions for Phytophthora infection. Phytophthora root rot is one of the oomycetes or water molds related to Pythium as well. So water 
is a key component in, in driving uh, the disease and those saturated soils, particularly because of the mobile zoospores that can swim in the water film between soil particles and actually migrate to the roots. Just imagine that. It's not dependent on anything. Those zoospores swim and infect those roots. This, how much cooler can you be than that, amen? If you're a pathogen, you're not dependent on anything as well. It also can infect early on, before the seed comes up, after the seed comes up, those damping off early um, symptoms. It can also affect later on in the season as we get heavy pounding saturated soils. Phytophthora root rot can, can also infect plants uh, late into the season as well. And we can see here we've got varying different degrees of, of uh, symptoms here in different early stages and later stages. So typically you see that, that wilting early on, you see that collapsing of the petioles, you see the leaves attached to them. You also will see that in most cases, as we dig these up, a lot of those lateral roots will be pruned off and it'll be a wet, mushy um, infection in that. And so all the roots are basically uh, rotted away. We've got nothing left. The, you've got a wilting on there. You see those leaves stay attached. Um, to those those plants and the other characteristic symptom in most cases as you can see with these is you get a beautiful purple brown lesion that extends up the soil line often maybe up to the first second trifoliate maybe the third but that's also very characteristic of phytophthora root rot and you can see other plants that are just starting to become infected having that typical early wilting starting to occur. Oh, look at this. This is a beauty. When it comes to that stem lesion that we see often with Phytophthora root rot, this is one of the big differences when distinguishing some other diseases, particularly one we're going to go up after this one and talk about Fusarium wilt in that where you don't see that that typical purpling or stem lesion associated with Phytophthora root rot. So let's talk management when it comes to Phytophthora root rot. As I mentioned, water is important. So anything we can do to move that water away from those roots. So tile drainage, um, uh, all of those type of conditions that move that excess moisture away is important and critical. You know, but whenever it comes to diseases and management, the first, first line of attack and the cornerstone and effective integrated disease management program always starts with genetics. And in the case of Phytophthora root rot, it's a great example of where we have host resistance or um, race specific resistance, you know, those RPS genes we always talk about, whether it's 1C, 1K, 3A, all, R, RPS8, all of those are important, but also that partial resistance or what we often call field tolerance uh, in many of the literature you'll see with the uh, seed companies. Incorporating both sources of that resistance helps get the soybeans off and, and, and minimize potential impacts from Phytophthora root rot. We can see uh, in this particular um, variety here, this is one that has very low partial resistance or tolerance to Phytophthora root rot, as well as no effective resistance genes. And you can see how, you know, the, it's having a field day with this variety compared to one here which has a very good tolerance and resistance package. Then you build that up and you add your seed treatments. Wow, we're getting a whole bunch of new choices when it comes to oomycete and Phytophthora pythium control. So you're starting to see more and more um, fungicide seed treatments that add on to say our allegiance apron, which have been the cornerstone, metal axle have been the cornerstone of Phytophthora seed treatments. Now we're starting to see multiple other products come to market and putting them together makes an effective disease package for Phytophthora with genetics, seed treatment, management, soil management, etc. can help us minimize Phytophthora root rot. But it's important also to remember, always be out in your fields, evaluate after we have those heavy rains, are you starting to see your varieties starting to show more Phytophthora? That could be an indication that certain pathotypes within that field or Phytophthora types are developing that can bypass that resistance. So that's always something we want to keep in mind. So always, don't, always, don't ever grow the same variety over and over because then you're just going to select for those 
uh, uh, field populations that can take down that resistance. Same thing as we say with soybean cyst nematode and that uh, phytophthora can be managed. It can be managed. We've had a long history of managing it, but it starts with resistance, seed treatments, a movement of uh, removing as much water as you can from that soil to make it less favorable and that. So it's a great disease. Unfortunately, it's one that we've got a long history of. We'll always have it, but we can manage it and try to avoid these issues. So as you can see, it's raining again. We were cool wet earlier on this spring, then it got hot and dry for three, four weeks or more. And then we started seeing towards the end of June, you know, lots of rain in this area. This particular area around Comber, Ontario, we had up to three, four, five inches of rain. And we started getting all kinds of calls, as I said, about what looked like Phytophthora root rot symptoms, wilting soybean plants and all that. As we saw at Woodsley, Phytophthora root rot, very typical of what we see that with that beautiful canker or lesion up the stem. With Fusarium wilt, we also get a wilting, but we don't see that characteristic lesion type. And also what we end up seeing in most cases is a root rot associated with it. And if we start cutting those stems, we start seeing very typical root rot type symptoms. And it's a disease that we've seen over the years. Um, it comes and goes some years, um, such as the early to late 90s and two, early 2000, 2004, we have a lot of fusarium wilt occurring. And we can, if we start cutting into those, you start seeing discoloration and root rotting of the, of the, of the top root and that. And then we can continue looking at these plants much different than what we see with root uh, with phytophthora root rot but again symptoms are very similar in many cases you get that typical wilting occurring but fusarium wilt is one of those that really likes that that hot dry cycles wet dry cycles through the season and we see this every five ten years or so where we see large acreages starting to um, show these typical fusarium wilt symptoms and we've seen it in Essex County, we're seeing it into Elgin, Chatham-Kent as well. But again, the weather drives a lot of it, and these frequent rain rainstorms helps that out as well. So just because you see something wilting doesn't necessarily mean it's Phytophthora. It could be some other root rots, and Fusarium wilt is one of those that again is showing up in 2020. There are about, you know, there's Fusarium oxysporum is the most aggressive that we see, and and in many cases, there can be anywhere from five, six different fusarium species on those roots that we can isolate in the province. You know, and we're going to go to another field where we see a, a, a related fusarium species, that that causes sun death syndrome. And we're going to go see that uh, next and, and talk about that as well. But you can see there's many different wilting diseases that can occur in the province. Just because they're wilting doesn't necessarily mean it's Phytophthora. One of the differences, though, management's difficult on the fusarium side we don't have that cornerstone as i said those genetic resistance that tolerance that that partial and uh, race specific resistance that we will see with phytophthora we don't have it in fusarium sure there are differences in varieties but we don't have the breeding effort or, or know what's really in our germplasm like we do with phytophthora root rot so seed treatments is is the main uh, method by which we can manage a fusarium, but again, without having that genetic background, when the environment is favorable, we're going to see more fusarium wilt like we have in 2020. So now that we got rid of that nonsense on the rain side of things, we had to drive 45 minutes from Comber to Rodney Westlorn, where we've got a number of different trials out here, and we're also seeing fusarium wilt in, in, in this location. This one has SCN, SDS, and we're picking up some fusarium wilt in some of, the, some of the areas here as well. And so one of the things to consider, and I didn't bring it up earlier when we were talking about it, was those above ground foliar symptoms. I talked about that wilting that we often see early on that, that maybe can confuse fusarium wilt with phytophthora root rot, but then it also can look like sun death syndrome, particularly early SDS and that where you start seeing that intervenal chlorosis, that yellowing between the veins, you get curling of the leaves, 
firing up of, of the plant itself and that. And then you start seeing the, the loss of the leaves and just the petioles. Very typical of what we see with SDS. But in this particular case this year, we started seeing those symptoms way before we saw any sudden death syndrome. Over the past week or so, or, or less, you know, maybe the past three or four days, really, we've been picking up more and more SDS symptoms. And I'll show you what, what that looks like. But again, above ground symptoms with wilt can look like SDS. The, the, the visuals though, um, you get more of a, you know, it's not as crystal clear as we often will see with, with SDS, um, that, that really vibrant greens, those vibrant yellow chlorosis, necrosis. You get more of a water soaking type look to those leaves and that, and then eventually they will start to, to, to fall off and just be left with the petioles. And you can see as we go along, that they, they, can, they can succumb quite quickly. They do like, look like SDS. And it's important, again, to dig those plants up, examine the roots. So much nicer when it's not raining on you to do that. Um, and that, so just dig them up. You can see this plant's lost a lot of the petioles, or the leaves and the petioles are still there. There is no canker on the base of the plant that we would normally see associated with, with Phytophthora root rot. We start seeing a vascular wilt in here. The other one to consider and think about is brown stem rot. We will also see brown stem rot symptoms that sort of have that SDS, intervenal chlorosis in that as well. Um, but with, 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 with brown stem rot, what we will see with brown stem rot is the pith as you move up that plant starts to become disintegrated. In this case, we still have the pith uh, clean and not showing typical brown stem rot. So Phytophthora, SDS, brown stem rot can all look like Fusarium wilt as well. Hence why Fusarium wilt often goes unnoticed. But in years like this, where we had those cool wet conditions, then those dry um, conditions, prolonged dry conditions, and then those wet again, those wet dry cycles really seem to push fusarium as well. But don't, so think about that. Keep that in mind, something to, to look, look at, dig up the plants, examine the roots, and, and, and try to distinguish between those, those three or four different diseases. Hi, I'm Tracy Bowdy from Omafra. I'm a field crop entomologist, and I'm going to talk about um, some of the key insect pests that are taking place right now, and then we'll discuss also some of the natural enemies that uh, you may see in the fields and uh, start looking for them before you make a spray decision. So first, um, 2020 has been an incredibly active insect year. Uh, I tried to pre it up by giving this uh, word cloud in butterfly, but really um, some of the big ones, almost all the outbreaks have been some of the major ones. So armyworm, now spider mite potentially, cereal leaf beetle, and potato leaf hopper, and as, long, as well as a few others. So any of the scouts out there that have been going nonstop, um, there's a reason for it because uh, it's certainly been a very active insect year. What I've seen in some of the um, Twitter feed in particular, I, I find Twitter is one of the better ways to um, get to really know what's going on. And I would say, you know, first and foremost are um, potato leaf hoppers. I'm, I'm concerned their levels are still quite high. We're seeing um, occasional rains, but not enough, I think, to really help the crop grow, especially in um, recently cut alfalfa, but also in dry beans. Um, please pay attention to some of the scouting there. Um, Josh and Ryan and many others have been um, showing what kind of levels they're seeing in the fields. Another one that's popping up especially, and this is a good picture of uh, when it shows up at the edge of the field, those symptoms that you're looking for of for spider mites. I think this is probably going to be more of a problem than we're um, assuming, or some may be assuming it will be, mainly again because we've had some spotty, um, spotty rains, and I think we're going to see some, some signs and symptoms showing up very soon. And in fact, um, Bruce had Bruce Court had shown how um, just shortly after going through a soybean field, 
just how much um, spider mites were um, clustering on the equipment. And that's a pretty good sign that they're active. And this is this is that um, bubble, that ballooning that they do. They all merge at one location so that they can get picked up and carried onto um, another plant in the field. So um, please take a look and, and search for your um, spider mites um, problems. But finally, um, Western Bean Cutworm. Uh, we're finally starting to see catches um, starting last week and egg masses. Even though the trap counts were low last week, they're starting to really um, go up this week. And lots of activity um, in the fields and even on Twitter and, and social media about finding egg masses. So keep an eye out for that. Follow Twitter and um, look for um, both the egg masses and the signs of maybe stink bug eggs, which are also there on Twitter to um, show you the differences. A couple of key issues that I do want to bring up this week in particular. Uh, if you go to Field Crop News, um, I did write a recent article about this. There are a few insects that are clipping silks right now. That includes rootworm adults, which are quite active right now and early. Um, but red-headed flea beetle are also doing the same kind of damage. And of course, Japanese beetle. So um, please go to um, Field Crop News and take a look at that article because I talk about thresholds, what you're looking for, and it really comes down to how much clipping they're doing and if the, the plants themselves can grow out of that clipping. Um, so go and check that out. But I also wanted to draw attention to where you can get the information about the pest monitor network, um, going back to the conversation about Western bean cutworms. So on Field Crop News, we have that tab, Pest Monitoring Network, and you can click onto the trap data dashboard to get to that dashboard. Just to save time, I'm gonna jump to the dashboard because that would have opened up. And you'll see in an overview, I'm astounded. Oh my God, I'm just sounding like Peter Johnson. I'm amazed at how many traps actually got up this year, even in the light of COVID. Um, and in particular, I just saw the count of, yesterday I counted it and it was 843 traps, Western Bean cutworm traps alone, that's just Western Bean. Um, but now that's even jumped up, it's, it's 884 now, um, which is amazing. So on this dashboard, you can click on the different tabs and I'm just gonna quickly show you what um, activity is going on with Western Bean Cutworm right now. So when you arrive on this tab, um, you do want to um, jump to the most recent week um, and then you can zoom in and you can see um, some of the activity that's going on and even within your own um, closer locale, you can click on these various um, traps and see what their latest count is. That's one way of doing it. Um, and certainly it applies for all of the different regions that are on this network. But another way to do it is if you go on the dashboard, you can actually start to see the analytics. So um, takes a little moment, but then if you select on um, from all pests, you click on to Western Bean Cutworm, for example, and I'm about to select yeah. Oh, it doesn't like, there we go. And the weeks, let's say anywhere from July until July 6th until today, you can actually start to see more activity um, specifically um, for that time period. Um, you can see all of the different traps again, specifically for Western Bean. Um, oh, sorry, 882 traps currently, but you can also take and click on to this um, graph and start to see how the numbers are starting to build up. Um, and if you're interested in knowing um, where those trap counts are, those specific traps, for example, you can click on this trap and it'll show you that that 209 Western Mean Cutworm count um, is actually from uh, the, I believe, the Ridgecown location. So um, just a quick snapshot of um, the info that you can get um, on the dashboard, but I also hope to download the data um, later today and show you how it compares to last year. And in particular, um, we've got a um, lot more moths coming in now, finally. It's about the same as last year. Um, but I, I do want to talk about the um, growth stage of the crop next. So in terms of managing Western bean cutworm, I realize that there's some locations that are ready for a fungicide timing. 
Um, I'm a little concerned that some are going to put insecticide in just in case. I really do encourage you to make sure you are seeing egg masses because we just started the flight and I can't promise how many more weeks from now we're going to see egg laying happening. So time it. Um, it may require separate applications if your timing's a little off. Um, but again, the threshold is accumulated 5%. If you are scouting the field and you see, let's say, over three weeks of scouting, um, you see any five plants with egg masses on it, that's a, a um, good indication that you need to spray. And please rotate your chemistries. I'm concerned that overuse of one particular chemistry is really going to have an impact on our ability to use that chemistry um, going forward. Uh, resistance, these caterpillars love to develop resistance, get used to something, and uh, we don't have a lot of products coming down the pipeline yet. So um, please keep that in mind. And I realize some saw later um, damage last year in um, 2019. Again, Western Maine really, it's not as much of a yield pest issue as it is it, it can create or um, increase the introduction of dawn. So in a good dawn year, that's when you see the impact. So um, really keep an eye out, monitor the fields uh, again later in August, early September to see what activity there is. Um, but you may again have to delay your spray just a bit to get the timing right for um, egg laying because we're just going up now. We're not near peak yet. So keep that in mind. And just to stay informed on these pest issues, I, I mentioned Field Crop News is always the best um, place to, to go to as well. Follow Twitter. I use hashtags. Everybody should be looking at Onto Egg, Scout 20, even West, uh, WB Cutworm. Um, and then, of course, the Great Lakes and Maritimes Test Monitor Network. And um, if you need pest control products, of course, you've got the Pest Manager app there, too. So now I want to talk about natural enemies. And I, I know some are going to say, why are we talking about natural enemies? Well, I think they're the, our next frontier of where we really determine when and if we need to spray. And I think it's really important to start paying more attention to them. Um, we here in Ontario have really good experience with natural enemies and just how much of an impact they can have um, on, for example, soybean aphids. There's free control for you and they're available. And we're, we're kind of proud of being one of the first jurisdictions to ever have a dynamic action threshold that's based on the level of natural enemies that you see versus the pest. Um, so that's pretty cool. That's that's a great thing for Ontario to say that we've done. And uh, as I said, uh, growers just realize how much of an influence they can have. But I also think we're starting to see such an adoption in cover crops and the soil health aspect that that it's really complementary to helping promote natural enemies. So um, I thought I'd take some time to, to point out some of the key groups of natural enemies. But most importantly that I'm concerned about, we're, we're seeing fewer pest control options coming down the pipeline. And with resistant cases happening, we're even losing some of the ones we have. So I think we've got to start changing that, let's just spray just in case um, situation to being very prescriptive when we need it. And I do think because of that lack of um, pipe pesticides, um, active ingredients coming down the pipeline, the next major focus will be biopesticides in some form, whether it's um, different fung fungal organisms, entomopathogens, um, we'll see. But I think that's the, the next where, way we go. Um, and we're, we're just starting to realize the impact and the influence, negative influence that both insecticide and even fungicides are having, both foliar and even what we're putting in the soil on some of these. So it, it's something to start to really focus on and, and um, give more attention to. And as we see with climate change coming uh, or here, um, we're going to need to start to help these natural enemies in any way we can, um, because we may have limited um, ability to, to manage our pests or at least um, need to help promote soil health and, and the environment that they need to um, help us out. So there's three main um, natural enemy groups. There's the predators, um, there's the parasitoids, and the pathogens. So I'll cover um, a few examples of each of them. So the generalists, they're predators. They just mow on anything that they can come across if they recognize it as a prey. Um, and they're probably the most obvious that most of us see. Um, and fortunately, 
that it's usually both the adult and the young, um, or maybe typically larva, that feed on that those um, hosts. So that's amazing. And they tend to be, not always, but tend to be a bit more resilient um, to change. So if there's a pesticide application or just temperature, only because they can move um, more quickly sometimes than some of the other, um, as long as they're in their adult form. So one of the key uh, new ones that I'm noticing more prevalent this year are soldier beetles. Um, and they don't get as much um, attention as they probably should. So they, the adults feed on um, both pollen and nectar, but also even insect eggs and smaller insects like aphids and caterpillars. Um, and they are, um, their larvae, which I'll show next, are also a predator, but for below ground. They look very much like, um, well, they're similar and closely related to fireflies. But when you um, look at the back end, like fireflies, their wings are shorter than their abdomen. So, th so that's a good way to tell that they are um, soldier beaters, especially very long antenna and um, short, um, shorter um, wings than their bodies. Next major group that everybody is at least aware of are ground beetles. Um, they mainly are on, on soil dwelling um, on the surface of the soil, um, but really benefit from no-till and reduced till scenarios. They play a major role, interesting, in, in weed suppression. Um, they are a lot of um, weed seed feeders, but also on slugs and insect pests. And most recently, um, there's been a study showing that they actually feed on western bean cutworm larvae, which is great because western bean cutworm, as you know, um, go from plant to plant. So there is some time um, when they're in on or in the ground. But they're also used as an indicator of ecosystem health and, and the impacts that are happening with those systems and changes. And so um, that recent study that we saw from Penn State showing the negative impacts that neonics seed treatments actually had because of the slugs taking in the neonics and not having an impact on them. But when the ground beetles take a bite, they get in, impacted. And, and so you sometimes actually see a, um, abundance of slug population um, because of that, in, because of the neonic um, seed treatment use. But there's also these, these have larval stages um, that are predators. So there's the ground beetle larva, which have, they look similar to wireworms, but they have very big jaws um, for mouth parts. And that's really because they are a predator and they like to, to feed on anything that they come across. So the, they, um, <laughs> Interestingly, ground beetle larvae can feed on um, amphibians, um, small frogs even, but they, um, I think, mainly stick to slugs and wireworms um, and springtails and anything else that they can find. That Here is the soldier beetle larva on the right. Um, it, to identify it, it has a scallop look to it, um, very much like doily, like the, the perfect round ridges to each of its abdominal segments. And I see a lot more, and I gotta say, I think this year in particular, more people are noticing insects and um, stiletto fly larvae come up often. Um, it's a transparent, somewhat long, slender um, maggot with a very pointed um, mouth part. Um, that wiggle quite a lot when you um, have them, let's say, on a shovel or a clump of dirt. And so they, these are all predators of those below ground pests that we have. But of course, ladybugs get the, the most obvious recognition. Um, we have some native ones like the pink lady, um, but also some non-native ones. And so if you see anything that looks like an alligator, which is very sim, it's their larval stage, or something with spots, or maybe not many spots, but round, um, it's likely a ladybug. And they are quite um, uh, hungry for um, many of the different pests that we have. I also get a lot of texts asking what this is. Um, when you see what, what sort of looks like a ladybug, but it's stuck to a plant, that's actually the ladybug pupa. So after the larva, they stick themselves to the plant because it's a resting state and they stay there until they molt into an adult. So they're not doing anything, but it's a good sign that you're gonna have adults very soon. They're, they have an incredible capacity to feed on our, our pests. So ladybugs, um, this is the work that was done um, both here in Ontario as well as others where they figured out how much, how many aphids um, these pests, these 
predators could do um, feed in a day. And lady beetles on average were 100 aphids a day, some of them even more so. Um, Multicolored Asian can be up to 400 a day, but um, they are a big component as well as lacewings and um, a midge larva and surfid larva that we see um, often. They are the heavy hitters when it comes to the predators, and especially aphids, but they also feed on caterpillars. Something interesting for all those people who have kids at home that may want a project, anything to do for this summer, um, there are some really good ladybug resources out there, Bug Guy being one, but also this discoverlife.org um, where you can actually click on what you're seeing out there. And why I bring that up is that there's actually situations where some of these lady bird, beetle, or ladybug species are very rare or endangered. And so there's actually some projects like um, the Lost Ladybug Project or even iNaturalist. There's a, a project for Ontario species to help um, identify some of those rare and tell, notify them if you find them, which would be great so that we understand really how endangered they are or maybe new detections that we didn't realize um, they were there. So something maybe you have your kids do. Um, I, I mentioned ladybugs, they can even actually have a clear role in western bean cutworm and there's a lot of work going on right now on biocontrol of western bean, um, but ladybugs can feed on the eggs and small larva as well as that minute pirate bug again and even uh, the lower sea um, larva is uh, lacewing larva. They're also a, a very good predator. So um, again, these are species that are there, but we need to assess and know that they're present and maybe having an influence before we um, keep spraying, and especially in the cases where we just spray in case um, without a, a real assessment of what's going on. Another one that I get a lot of texts on um, or questions on are stink bugs. So there are a group of predatory stink bugs and, and they're not as easy to identify, although most of them have pointed shoulders as the adult. Um, but the real way to identify them is to look at their, their beak or proboscis. And if it's thicker than their, the, the um, width of their antenna, it's a predator because it needs to harpoon into its prey. And they are really good they love caterpillars, but I've seen them even take out dragonflies, um, sadly monarchs sometimes, um, or even some of their own, um, which is good uh, if it's a if it's a pest species. So, but look look always for pointed um, shoulders and their wide beak, and if you're looking at eggs. And this is where I say eggs are often misidentified as um, Western mean cutworm eggs. They're barrel shaped. So Western mean are very round. The pest species and, and predator species are barrel shaped with a ring of thorns. The predator species has a bigger, longer thorn, um, thor each thorn on their um, halo versus the, the pest species. So that's a way of doing, of knowing if they are a predatory um, stink bug. And finally, in the predator group um, is predatory mites. And, and this, these play a role um, as well as the, fung the entomopathic fungi. fungi. Um, these mites play a role in spider mite control. So they feed both on thrips and aphids as well as spider mites. But there are some studies that show, um, we know pyrethroids, as soon as you spray on the crop, it kills the predatory mites and um, gives way for freedom for the um, spider mites to actually um, flourish. And, and same goes with neonics. There's indications that um, applications of neonics can do the same on the predatory mites and flare up the spider mite population. So that's the predators. Now I'm gonna quickly go through some parasitoids that we know um, are pretty prevalent. The issue with parasitoids is that they are very host specific. They require in some cases, the very specific life stage of the host, not just the host, but that life stage of the host. So sometimes they can get out of sync if there's been a change in, in weather patterns or environment that benefits the um, host and not the parasitoid. And of course, they're also um, quite often more sensitive to insecticides. So a key one is T. julis. Uh, it's a wasp for cereal leaf beetle. Um, first, when cereal leaf beetle came in Michigan and Ontario way back, well, around before I was born, I'm not gonna age myself, um, 
and and um, they released some of these wasps um, to see how well they could do. And now they're even finding them in Western Canada, which is great. It shows you it's really um, spreading out. But they are impacted by overwintering sites because the um, wasp overwinters down in, in the soil or near the soil. But also warmer springs benefit the cereal leaf beetle. Um, they are able to get up and going um, and develop quicker than the wasps. So you sometimes see that out of syncness. But we've had some shown or seen studies where parasitism rates can be anywhere from 15% to 95% if the conditions are, are favorable. Another, um, so that was an example of one that was actually introduced and released from Europe um, where cereal leaf beetles were from. Um, these came accidentally. So uh, the top one is Aphelinus certus, which was found here um, shortly after soybean aphids arrived. So they came at some point with an introduction of soybean aphids. Um, you can actually see the tiny wasp developing and trying to come out of the aphid. But we know that um, studies done here, dimethoate and, and matador um, silencer can have a detrimental impact on them, as well as you see reduced rates of parasitism on neonic um, treated soybeans. So um, just an, again, an example of where we've got to start deciding um, what's the pest that you really are concerned about and how you manage it um, instead of trying to manage them all. Um, another one is uh, Sinopes uh, mylis. It's a non-native again. It came here with um, sweet midge, and we're starting to see indications of its presence here. Hopefully, we can um, increase its paratism rate. But again, studies are showing that um, depending on the insecticide that we select, we can have an impact or influence on um, the um, wasps. So in particular, matador has a much more significant impact than um, corrigin, for example, um, that we've used on, on sweet mint and canola. And uh, not only are wasps parasites, but also flies. And a good indicator, or we've seen this before with armyworm. Um, in fact, there's been studies that show that armyworm has up to 23 different parasites found here in Ontario. 15 of them are very common, but one of the, the main ones is a tachinid fly. And so the fly lays its eggs close to the head of the, the larva. The fly um, larva hatch out of that egg and mine into the armyworm and slowly eat itself um, out. <laughs> and so obviously the armyworm doesn't do very well after that. Here's one more interesting one. Um, Dinocampus, um, it's a type of wasp that parasitizes ladybugs. But, and this is why I'm always saying that insects are cooler than diseases and Albert can't claim that right because this wasp um, lays its egg inside the, lar the ladybug. The ladybug um, keeps going, the larva develops inside of it. When the larva comes out of the ladybug, the larva has now given a virus to the ladybug and the ladybug's behavior changes where it becomes a bodyguard to the cocoon of the wasp larva. And it will actually even um, kind of tremor and, and try and look still active and scare off any predators that may come and try and get that wasp larva. And then the wasp larva hatches and most of the time the ladybug survives somehow um, having developed a uh, wasp larva inside it. So I thought that was a pretty cool one. Finally, um, pathogens play a big role um, in, and obviously they require the right environment, but I think this is probably the next level of um, even pesticides that we're going to see um, coming in the future. And yes, I get to talk about pathogens and, and step into Albert's territory a bit here too. But we know obviously bacteria can have a big impact, um, Bt being one of the most widely used and known um, um, biocontrol out there. It's very specific depending on which cry you're using to what group of insects um, they work on. And even they're starting to notice that it can have some impact in certain human cancer cells, which is a pretty cool thing. Um, fungi is the next one, and I think this is where we start to need to also look at our 
behavior and use of fung fungicides because I think entomopathogens can have a pretty big role in controlling our pest issues if they're given the right environment. So it, in some cases, they can take only 24 hours um, of 90% humidity and um, flourish. And I thought this was an interesting study to bring up in that the one of the main um, fungi that infect spider mites, actually, they're noticing that the male mites prefer dead females that died from the fungus than healthy ones. And that is a way of the fungus being able to prolif proliferate um, by having the males come to the, the female um, that's already infected. Um, and it, here's another example. Um, um, alfalfa weevil has in the past been significantly infected. Um, they saw mass infection of them way back in the 70s, and it's been noticed um, widely now in North America. Um, Zuphora, where uh, it infects the larva, the larva turn kind of a yellow, then brown, and eventually looks like a fuzzy um, bread, loaf of bread. Um, and that can wipe out the population pretty quickly. But they're also noticing it has a negative impact on the parasitoid, because the parasitoid needs that host to survive. And if the hosts don't survive, then nor do the parasitoids. And one final one is, is viruses. Um, we know that there's a few key viruses. E even insects can get viruses. We're dealing with a virus now as humans. Even insects can get viruses. And we've noticed in the past um, a, a, some um, bacterial virus that um, can infect armyworm and even western mean cutworms. So there's another frontier that we may see happening. One final cool one. Um, is nematodes. Um, so <laughs> I get to talk about nematodes. Um, there's work being done at Cornell, um, Elson Shield. They have found a way to infect or um, embed, have nematodes inside wax moths. Um, and there's native species, three key native species of nematodes that can suppress alfalfa snout beetle and even rootworm um, larva. So, and there's there's potential for wireworms and grub control too. Um, and because it's native to North America, we can actually get them shipped here in Ontario. And a few growers that I know have um, done so um, to try and suppress their rootworm populations, and in particular in organic. Um, it, it, um, production, but also even in um, scenarios in the states where there's some significant rootworm resistance to the BTs, um, where they're seeing not only just conventional, um, comparing conventional with the nematodes having great success, but even some of the, um, uh, the different rootworm BTs showing less root clipping because uh, in, in the presence of these nematodes because they've controlled the rootworms. So that, that's probably another area that we're going to see um, happening shortly. And finally, how do we promote these? So the, the big push and, and positive things that have been going on with pollinator habitat, well, that's very similar to what natural enemies need. Um, they, they want biodiversity and, and several species mixed together um, and blooming at different times because these, some of these natural enemies need nectar and pollen to feed too. So I think, you know, um, any initiatives that do um, buffer zones or um, change marginal land over or even have strip cropping um, that bring the natural enemies there close to the, the crop is a great thing. And also less tillage. Some of these overwinter or um, rest in and on the soil and they, they need um, undisturbed uh, ground. And some of the decisions that we have to make for pesticides. Maybe we move towards having trap crops where we plant the crop a little earlier than the rest of the field, few you know small areas of the field that may attract the pests there first and we focus our spray there. Or we, of course, only spray when threshold has been reached um, and we um, make a selection based on uh, reduced risk um, and including fungicides um, in some cases. And then, of course, also maintaining buffer zones to keep those um, natural habitats, natural enemy habitats um, safe from the pesticides. There's lots of resources. I provided a few links to both how to, to know how to preserve or promote natural enemies in your fields and also um, online identification some, for some uh, insect. Um, I get a lot of questions on what is this. And so I've given you guys some, some resources to uh, go to first and take a look. So with that, thank you. So let's talk sun death syndrome now. SDS has been in the province since 1988. 
We've seen a progression and movement of sudden death syndrome. It is closely associated with soybean cyst nematode. So basically where we end up with cyst nematode, we end up seeing SDS as well. This is a good example. You know, we're into the, the middle of, of July at this point. We've had some good rains. We're starting to see SDS symptoms uh, start to show. Very similar to what I've talked about with Fusarium wilt, similar conditions for sun death syndrome in that cool wet conditions early on, particularly those wet conditions um, at planting, allow the Fusarium virgiliformi fungus uh, pathogen to colonize that root tissue and then continue to develop. And then as we have, say, a hot dry or a dry period or those rains that normally come um, in July, end of July, early August, start to move or, or you start to see the expression of the SDS foliar symptoms. And that rain is important because these symptoms that we're starting to see, these early SDS symptoms, aren't a result of the pathogen, such as with Fusarium wilt, that's plugging up the plumbing system. In this particular case, it's a toxin being produced that's moved up to the plants, up into the upper parts, up to the leaves, and it's causing these typical uh, leaf symptoms, that yellowing, that chlorosis, that intervenal necrosis, etc. And you often start seeing those, those SDS symptoms down low, working their way up, you start seeing that yellow necrosis um, between the veins and over time they can start to join up. You get necrosis or browning and then working their way up, up the plant and you soon start seeing more and more of the leaf tissue being effective. Here's a, a good example here where we're starting to see more of that yellowing, more of that intervenal chlorosis. You're starting to get that sharp discoloration of them and this particular variety here as you can tell compared to you know this one and that one on either side this is our susceptible check we run susceptible checks all through our trials and locations so we have a good indication of disease pressure and you can see from the one end to the other we're starting to see early SDS symptoms and hence we know we've got good SDS uh, um, levels in, in the soil for, for our tests so Above ground symptoms, very typical. And then what we can do, you dig up those plants. Always dig up the plants, no matter what you're looking for. It's your shovel is your friend. And we can see we've got quite a bit of roots on here. We've got some discoloration of the root system and then hence you want to see you've got that yellowing as we normally see with SDS here very early symptoms more advanced and then we'll look at the um, um, really advanced symptoms later on where we end up seeing that defoliation that we often see associated with SDS and if we cut these plants off we should see again a discoloration of the root system very typical of fusarium root rots, and SDS. So again, as that fungus, as the uh, Fusarium virgiliformi collects or colonizes that tap root, that's where the toxins produce, and then those late season or mid season rains come in, flush it up, hence giving us those, those beautiful, beautiful leaf symptoms that we often see associated with SDS. So as we showed earlier, early SDS symptoms um, can be noticeable. They start off as those small little yellow chlorotic spots, necrosis down low, work their way up. Here we're starting to see in this particular field that has really good SDS pressure. Um, on this variety here, we're starting to see much more of the pronounced lower symptoms for, of, of the plant for SDS. You're seeing considerable amount of that intervenal chlorosis, necrosis. We're seeing it work its way up the plant right now. We're seeing that typical stunting as well. What we aren't seeing just yet is that defoliation or those leaves starting to fall off, what, like we saw with the fusarium wilts and that typical of some of the fusariums where you lose the leaves but the petioles stay attached. Very typical. So 
the earlier these symptoms occur, this is pretty early for, for the middle of July um, to have these symptoms, um, we will see a, a, a big impact on yield. We've seen 20%, 30% or more on SDS um, on varieties that are um, start showing SDS much earlier. One of the questions we often get asked about these new seed treatment, um, SDS seed treatments that are out there and that one of the benefits for them in many cases is that it can delay those symptoms. If it delays those symptoms even two or three weeks into the grain fill period, that's where we can get that, that yield uh, protection or those, those yield increases in that. But again, it's important to make sure that you have a good variety, a tolerant variety, in with those um, SDSC treatments. So when it comes to corn diseases right now, we're not seeing a lot. We're not seeing our typical northern corn leaf blight, our gray leaf spot, been slow to develop um, in the province, which is good news in that. But one that's gained a lot of interest and attention, we get asked all the time, is tar spot. So what I'd like to do right now is let's go talk to the experts. Let's go talk to a couple of my colleagues from the U.S. and see what they got to say about tar spot. Today I've got you know two really good friends of mine, uh, Darcy Talenko, Dr. Darcy Talenko, uh, Purdue University plant pathologist, and uh, Dr. Martin Chilvers, Michigan State University field crop pathologist as well. And that, and we're going to talk tar spot. Yeah, tar spot has been one of those diseases, a lot of attention. It's always the first or second question I get asked, and with the most recent events, uh, both in Indiana and Michigan, of the over the past what couple of weeks, where we've started to uh, detect tar spot for 2020. Again, a lot of interest and and impact. But you know, let's go back, Darcy, to 2015 when uh, tar spot was first found in 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 the U.S. and in Indiana as well. Eh? So what were what's the experience? How has it a uh, changed over time. Okay, yeah, so Albert, yeah, we first found a tar spot in 2015 here in Indiana and in Illinois. Um, from that initial find, we assumed we, that with one pathogen of the complex that was talked about out of Latin America, um, that really wasn't going to be a problem. So it's been around since 2015. We've had samples sent into our clinics 2015, 16, 17. Um, but it began in 2018 is when we saw some significant yield impacts of tar spot here in Indiana. Yeah, and that, those yield impacts in 2018 uh, were quite significant through much of the corn, Midwest Corn Belt as well, right? Correct, and uh, particularly in our states here in Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Michigan is, was where we saw 20 to 60 bushel yield losses, about what we saw on average in the northern part of our state at least. Yeah, and those yield losses were you know, quite alarming, right? And and hence a lot of that attention, maybe from those first few years where weren't really sure what was going to happen, but 2018 really woke everybody up to tar spot, especially. And of course, its movement from Indiana and elsewhere is also, um, you know, of interest. And particularly, you know, we've got a border that we share with the U.S. and particularly with Michigan. And Marty and I are only you know, under three hours away. And uh, he's been good enough to find tar spot right up to the Canadian border. And we have not yet <laughs> detected it in that. And of course that's uh, uh, concerning as well. We know we're gonna find tar spot at some point, right, Marty? And, uh, you know, I'm just curious, Marty, when you first found tar spot in Michigan, you know, when, as we're gonna find, you know, what kind of reaction did you get? <laughs> what did you expect from it? Uh, well, when we very first found it, we weren't really too sure, right? 2016, that was, we had uh, one field with some symptoms in it, very, very late in the season. Um, so really not, not much of an impact. Um, come back 2017, that same county out on the west side of the state, we had a, a field that was really lit up with it. So we knew we were dealing with something pretty serious. Then 2018 hit, of course, and that was really quite bad, uh, especially for the western side of Michigan, it only really spread through to central Michigan. Uh, 2019 was pretty dry uh, in July and August. And we didn't really see the losses that we did like in 2018. Um, perhaps 2019 losses were somewhere around 20 bushels, depending, um, depending on the situation. 
but we did see continued spread, right? And that's where we did see spread right up to, to the border, essentially, with, with Ontario there. So a spread right up into the thumb of Michigan, uh, pretty late um, detections there because it's the disease is sort of spreading from that, that epicenter in um, Indiana, Illinois. Um, so it's probably, yeah, probably going to be in Ontario this season, I would suspect. Yeah, and, and you know, I, and I, I don't doubt that as well. Um, if not this year, it will be for sure uh, in the foreseeable future in that. Um, and I guess, you know, so what, you know, what should we be looking for, right? You talk about late season, um, and that's been the general trend. And I would assume Ontario, we will see that uh, post-pollination, which we're into right now. So, you know, incidence and severity, more than likely that first year will be minimal as what you've seen in the past. Um, you know, you know, we, we hear of tar spot, you know, the, the, it's pretty descriptive just in the, uh, the name and that, uh, Darcy, what are some of the symptoms in, in scouting procedures that we should be looking at? So I guess it depends where you are. If you have a field with a history, we're going to start low and we're going to start in the lower canopy. And that's what we're seeing right now this year is those fields that have a significant history of tar spot, the disease is starting low and it produces these stroma, little black spots on the leaves. Um, when you look at them, if you can't scratch them off, if you can't remove them, that's when we really want to look closer to confirm that we do have tar spot. Um, as if it's later in the season or you haven't had the history, then you may want to start up in the middle of the upper canopy. It may be blowing in on the, the weather. Um, but again, it's, you know, we're looking for these raised bumps. They look unique. They're growing within the tissue um, and just, you know, there's no rupture like a, a, a rust pustule or something else but it, again it's growing in the tissue and you can't you can't remove it if you try to scratch at it and that's a good point in terms of where on the plant you notice the symptoms right you, we always talk about established uh, pathogens uh, field history etc where you're you're from residue soil moving up the plant as opposed to these ones that are airborne and and are new introductions into a field where you'll see them higher up in in the canopy and that. No, that is a, an excellent point and, and that as well. You know, in terms, Marty, you mentioned last year being a little drier and that. Uh, 2018, um, I assume, was a perfect storm. Environmental conditions were favorable. You know, what, what should we be looking from an environment standpoint? Right. So, I mean, it, it really appears that moisture is a key driver for this disease, right? So if we have frequent rainfall, then we're more likely to see tar spot develop. Um, again, 2019 was pretty dry, you know, mid-July and August, so that really slowed it down. Um, but it did tick up towards the end of the season, and that's, that's where we saw, you know, some losses just towards the end of that, that season. Um, so that will be something just to be watching for this year, just how, how is the weather progressing, how much rainfall are we getting. Uh, and thinking about that too, you know, we have quite a bit of irrigated production in southern and southern Michigan and northern Indiana. Um, and irrigation seems to be a real key driver as well, right? So it's all about leaf moisture, uh, whether that's from precip irrigation or um, dew forming on the on the leaves. So that there's some factors to be to be conscious of, I guess. And and when it comes to to management, you know, it being a foliar a corn foliar disease is it the same management as we would do with northern corn leaf blight or gray leaf spot or does it require some different uh, strategies um so i mean i think it's 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 similar right we do have fungicides that have efficacy um and darcy can comment on this too but i think the one slight difference here is that it does seem to explode rather quickly uh, perhaps compared to northern leaf blight and gray leaf spot um, you know, with tar spot, we won't have, you know, a prevalence of, of lesions on the plants. Um, you know, one week, we go back the next week and it's starting to really get going. And in another week, it's really taking off, right? Much, much quicker, I think, than northern leaf blight and gray leaf spot. So to me, that's that's been, it behaves a little bit more like a rust, right? It's very rapid in its its disease progression. And so we need to be very vigilant in our scouting efforts. And I would say when we're looking at the timing, you know, we're, we've started looking at our standard BTR1 application, but because this is a later disease, we may want that protection extended further into the season to help us get to that black layer. Um, and if, and I, some of our trials that we did have out last year where we did see a significant tar spot, you could see where that fungicide window ran out of steam. And after that three week window, it was starting to take off again in the canopy. 
And so that's the one thing we really caution. We really got to narrow in this time frame, and we haven't figured that all yet, out yet. But it, definitely, we need to well time fungicide in order to try to protect that crop yield. So, in terms of uh, fungicide timing, you know, post pollination, post uh, silking, uh, R1, and that are, are traditional timings there, the tassel and and uh, silking timing. You know, that means we need to be out in the field scouting as well. Then, you know, going, you know, you know, two, three, four weeks after, uh, not just wait to do a pre-harvest uh, scout as well. And in that, in terms of 2018, the timing that you first started seeing um, tar spot was that similar to maybe the, this past year, or was it much earlier? Marty, do you know when you first saw? Uh, it? 2018, I believe it was um, the first week of July, so around about sixth of sixth of July. Um, so we're, we're, I mean, we're trending somewhat similar this season. I mean, we've still got a long way to go, but. That, that's sort of what we're seeing. But in terms of the first uh, first detections for for that year, you were only off by maybe what a week or so. Not a not a you know not a month or so where you had a lot of ability for the disease and tar spot to build up, right? And and that right. so a lot of that was due to the favorable conditions that just as you mentioned, as you both mentioned, uh, how rapid this disease can can develop. And those cycles can uh, to can proceed just like a rust, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean we have been pretty dry this season to date, right? So I think that that may have slowed things down this season somewhat. But we still got you know last week of July here and all of August to go. So we'll, we'll see how those you know those weeks pan out in terms of rainfall. So if you had some words of wisdom for Ontario producers or in the ag industry, uh, what would that be? I scout, say, right? Yeah, scout. Be aware of it. Just be on the lookout. I wouldn't worry about it yet if you haven't seen it, but just be on the lookout to notice if some, you see something unique you haven't seen before. You know, send send Marty or send us send a sample in to have it confirmed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I think it's a really good idea to get that confirmed. I mean, we did have a lot of confusion. Uh, well, last year and this year with um, insect frass on the plants, right? And as Darcy talked about already, you know, just make sure that it's not insect frass, don't freak out and go and spray insect poop because that's really not going to help you out. But, you know, first thing, I guess, you know, scouting, be aware, follow it, track, you know, the tracking are part, you know, we're part of the network and all that. So that's always yeah. uh, important and that, but also, I guess, just don't be afraid, right? We can, we can manage it. There are tools available, as you mentioned. Um, there are some hybrids. Uh, that's always being evaluated as well. Fungicides are available. You know, the timing may be something totally different than what we're normal, normally used to, but uh, it's not, don't, you know, don't be uh, afraid of it, you know, and uh, everybody's working on it and we should be able to manage it quite effectively as you guys have been. Excellent. Thank you both. We greatly appreciate it. And uh, one day we'll be able to uh, get together again. That'd be great.